Cool. I think we could uh, squeeze everybody in. Um, thank you so much for coming, everybody, um, for uh, this uh, tech talk on the uh, rise of multimodal AI. So uh, just quickly on uh, myself and Alex, I'm Ulrich, uh, one of the co-founders of Ancourt. Um, I lead our go-to-market function. I'm joined here by Alex, uh, who lead our solutions team. Uh, Alex has a master's in physics from Imperial College London. He's written the uh, de facto standard on uh, fine-tuning the second editing model, um, which has been implemented more than 5,000 times and read more than 100,000 times. Uh, before that, he uh, ran his own uh, sure tech startup um, that he scaled um, <laughs> based out of London. So very fortunate to have him uh, join us here today to do a talk on the uh, rise of multi-modal AI. And I want to thank all of you for, for coming. Um, just want to say a few words about uh, Uncourt. Next slide. Uh, we're building a data development platform for AI. So we work specifically with um, vision and multi-modal applications. Um, so we build tooling that helps you with uh, data management, creation, annotation, and workflow tooling, and also uh, model testing and evaluation. Next slide. Uh, we work with uh, more than 100 uh, 50 of the world's top uh, AI startups and also big enterprise uh, that are building all different types of applications in healthcare, retail, Gen AI, uh, automotive, and a bunch of others. Uh, we're very fortunate to be backed by uh, CRV, one of our investors, who has kind of, kindly uh, agreed to uh, host us at their office today and also provided us with some very nice uh, snacks and beverages. Um, so just want to give them uh, a shout out. Um, I think without further ado, I think there's one more slide. Um, here's just a little bit uh, more about Uncourt. So if you want to stay connected, um, if you want to read any of our content or check out our uh, multi-modal tooling, you're welcome to do so. We have a few QR codes here. We'll leave that up after the presentation. Um, so you can always go and scan it afterwards. But I think without further ado, Alex, uh, over to you. Great. Thanks, Ulrich. So um, we'll go through a few things in our talk today. Um, so we'll start with a brief introduction. I'm sure a lot of people here are already familiar um, with you know, the developments in the space. So just to get people uh, a little bit up to speed. Uh, kind of hard to hear the back. So oh, like, testing. Great. Um, so to get people you know, uh, up to speed, so we're all speaking the, the same language here. Um, we'll then you know, motivate the case for uh, multimodal AI. So understanding, uh, you know, what are the current limitations in the AI systems that we have in place today um, and why we might want to go uh, kind of fully multimodal uh, and we'll understand uh, what that means uh, better through that section. Um, we'll then look at use cases that are currently um, you know, tackled or currently uh, you know, starting to be tackled but also look uh, further into the future uh, to understand use cases that might be further out um, and then throughout the presentation We'll then look at how we can build these multimodal models, how we can then serve some of these more uh, kind of esoteric and innovative uh, use cases, uh, and finally understand why we haven't arrived there yet um, and what might be around the corner. So as an introduction, um, you know, most models uh, that used to be called machine learning, now uh, we've moved into sort of AI uh, domain, um, have been unimodal and extremely task specific. So, if you, you know, go back sort of five, 10 years, um, we were all implementing, you know, uh, writing TensorFlow code uh, to try and build, for example, like a simple object detection model. Um, these were extremely task specific, not super generalizable, um, and by nature, unimodal. Now, you know, the availability of sort of hosted, closed, um, you know, unimodal uh, LLMs has really sparked off this, this new explosion in the general use of AI. Um, and it's been essentially, you know, capturing the public interest, but also um, allowing us to, to tackle, uh, you know, more complex use cases that are uh, seemingly more general and easier to interact with, um, with uh, by the general public. Um, this has been powered by kind of three main verticals. Um, first is, of course, advancements in uh, the architectures. So uh, things like, you know, we're more pretty standard on the uh, transformer architectures now. Um, they're allowing us to... Uh, take kind of a unified approach to these problems across different modalities. And now as we go forward, start to join them together. The availability of data, of course, um, a key driver to this, uh, and also uh, you know, compute power um, has been uh, something that's, that's allowed us to, to train these models on a huge scale. Um, the sort of general text-based conversational models uh, that we've seen so far um, you know, can be surprisingly useful. Sometimes they can do things that we haven't uh, you know, design them uh, to do, but they're not really suitable for multimodal applications. Uh, we started to see the rise of some multimodality, uh, typically, you know, image, uh, imagery with text, um, but we're lacking other dimensions, things like videos, sensors, 
um, and ultimately the bounds on performance uh, that we'd expect for domain specific applications um, have not been uh, enforced consistently uh, with these sorts of models. Um, you know, text-based models came first, of course, because of the introduction of uh, transformer architectures to natural language, um, but also because of the availability of data, right? When you're just trying to predict the next token in a, a sequence of uh, words, um, that's something that you can use, you know, very, very widely available, uh, large corpuses of data scraped off the internet um, to achieve. The, uh, the last point I was gonna make here around the sort of bounds on uh, performance, um, you know, we know on these, these LMs, uh, we can get all sorts of quirky behaviors, um, and that's something that needs to be tackled in and of itself, but is also a challenge as we expand into additional modalities where the complexity is going to increase. So things like, for example, um, the, there was a viral example recently on uh, the sort of you know, rehearsal curse, right, where you can ask a question one way and then revert it, um, and, and the, the model won't have a good answer for the, uh, the second case, right? And that's something that we want to avoid um, in really domain-specific, sensitive applications, um, and it's going to become increasingly a problem with, with multimodality. So why are LLMs uh, going to replace LLMs? So, I mean, Seems like an obvious point, but the, the world is fundamentally uh, multimodal. So many domains have uh, data that you know is not expressible in text or is not uh, kind of close to its original representation when expressed in text. Now, you know, let's say we're building uh, a model to try and understand uh, intent, right, in, in in voice or try and understand emotion in, in a video. Um, we could hack around, you know, just using an LLM. Maybe we can incorporate. Uh, additional sort of meta tags on each token that we feed to the LLM. Um, but this is, you know, an example of sort of classical kind of like feature engineering um, that is not going to necessarily generalize well as we take this model to new use cases. Um, in the case of, let's say, you know, understanding uh, audio, um, it's something that won't generalize nicely to, uh, let's say, other languages, um, you know, other uh, sort of ways of expressing oneself. Um, and so we need to really tackle the problem at its source, which is to integrate um, that new modality. Um, ultimately, we want to, in a first wave, sort of like match human perception understanding. So we're fundamentally multimodal beings, right? We sense, uh, you know, we, we, we view things, um, we, we have haptic feedback, those sorts of things. Um, but once we get there, that's great, but we can actually go even uh, further uh, beyond that level of uh, capability. So in the same way that text is often a uh, sort of derived representation of the real world, um, you know, we also see uh, various first-class modalities, let's say, uh, you know, hyperspectral imagery, um, things like sensor data, we cannot interpret that uh, as a first-class modality. So having a multimodal LLM, that, uh, I'm sorry, a multimodal model that takes that in um, and is able to process it as a first-class modality uh, will fundamentally change uh, the way that these models can uh, give us information uh, and be useful to us beyond what we're able to, to do. Um, one of the points that I wanna make as well is uh, in terms of informational redundancy. Now, let's say you know, we go back to that sort of uh, transcription example. Um, why don't we just use the audio signal, right? That, that's great. Why incorporate video? Um, that's redundant. But by taking advantage of the natural redundancy that we have in these modalities, um, we can actually boost the accuracy uh, of the model. So let's say a, a transcription model, um, we're able to uh, then leverage the fact that sometimes the uh, audio signal is corrupt and we can fill that in with the uh, video uh, signal that's coming in. Um, we might be working in you know, compromised environments, et cetera, and having as much information as possible that represents what is actually happening will allow us to, to boost accuracy further. Uh, finally, you know, text alone is useful, um, but even in purely textual tasks, it actually uh, you know, we can gain in the applications by uh, incorporating, let's say, spatial representations, right? Um, if we're looking at invoices or signs or whatever that might be, um, being able to express hierarchies between the text entities that are present um, allow us to unlock a whole new level of, of performance and capabilities. Uh, we've got this uh, screenshot uh, down at the bottom from uh, Jan Lekun, um around uh, a post that he made about the sort of bandwidth of language, right? Um, and, you know, it's not just us. Sort of saying that this stuff is, is going to be useful, um, but actually, you know, the, the, the sort of thought leaders and uh, and you know key figures in AI are also um, really really focused on being able to bring in those additional modalities to better capture and interact with the the real world. If we compare that to uh, vision, yes, what's, I, the, what's the actual difference there? 
So, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, I don't have the, uh, the, the numbers uh, at the top of my head, um, but you can you can immediately start to see, you know, if the, when you look at text, right, you can have all of Shakespeare in a, a megabyte, right? If you uh, if you were to, to look at you know, recordings of the, uh, the shows uh, or the sort of, uh, you know, uh, people acting it, then, then we're talking many, many orders of magnitude. Yeah, I think uh, Vision is uh, 20 megabytes per second versus 12 bytes per second for text. So, uh, yeah. quite a bit higher. Quite a bit higher. Great. Um, so, just kind of capturing all of that in a in a clear transition from traditional AI to uh, you know modern AI and, and, and kind of the future of AI. Um, we're moving from, as I mentioned at the start, you know, used to be building these models from scratch, really, really domain specific, to leveraging foundation models, um, fine tuning them, uh, and having that generalizability available to us um, when we deploy them. Moving from model centricity to data centricity now. You know, there are new advances uh, happening in, in model development every day, and those are extremely important. Um, but for most users and implementers of these kinds of systems, we want to actually uh, just leverage what's available in these kind of highly performant and generalizable architectures by showing them uh, specific uh, examples and uh, that are specific to our use case. The unimodality to multimodality, of course, the, the theme of this talk, but also finally, I think the accessibility piece as well, where um, you know we had before just ML experts interacting with AI systems uh, in, a, uh, in a way that they knew, right? Lots of people were already uh, subject to certain AI systems, but not interacting with them actively on a daily basis. Um, now, you know, we've seen uh, you know, uh, people signing up to, to chat GPT and interacting with it in their daily lives, in their daily jobs across a whole range of industries um, and being first class users of these AI systems. So this is a, a sort of fun example that I wanted to, to show. Um, so this uh, is a screenshot of me using uh, ChatGPT uh, with uh, for with, with Vision, and I asked it to um, do a very very simple thing. I said, "Can you draw bounding boxes around the people?" Um, I want to use a specific coordinate system, um, and uh, I described the coordinate system briefly to it um, and told it to, to output some some bounding boxes. Now, if you used a traditional uh, object detection model, you get very results, good results here. This is a simple scene. Um, you know, we don't have uh, crazy occlusion or um, you know any other kind of confounding factors. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward problem. Now, this is the result that uh, you know I got um, personally. I'm not very satisfied with this result. You can see um, that you know bounding boxes are all over the place. Um, I think we have one good detection sort of over here, which is pretty good. Um, we've missed most of the other people in the scene. And some of these bounding boxes are, are completely all over the place. Um, they're the wrong size, um, they're in the wrong place, they're not detecting the people accurately. I had a back and forth trying to sort of you know, reset my problem, re-explain the coordinate system, uh, but I couldn't get a good output. And you could look at this and say, okay, well, what do we need to do, right? It's already multimodal. But actually, the multimodality is not just in the input, but also in the output, right? Like ChatGPT here does not speak kind of coordinates, right? It doesn't understand how to express that in the output in a uh, performant or reliable fashion. And this is with 1.7 uh, sort of trillion parameters uh, that it's, it's failing to do this. So um, we can look at an example where we can then take, uh, let's say, a, a, an open source model, fine tune it, add new modalities to it, and see uh, far higher performance for our specific use case. Great, so um, you know, what can we actually do with these uh, multimodal models? So we have a sort of general list of, of, of things that, that could be interesting, but I want to focus on, on a few of these. So, um, and talk about the modalities uh, that are associated with these specific use cases. So personalized medicine, for example, um, we don't think about, uh, let's say, you know, DNA uh, being a first class uh, entity, right, being a modality. Now you could, of course, just dump a string uh, of all the uh, you know the appropriate uh, DNA representations into an LM, uh, but it won't be treating this as a first class modality. Probably won't have the uh, the context length to understand that, um, and also uh, will not have you know optimized behavior uh, when uh, when looking at the situation. And personalized medicine, for example, is a situation where you need very tight guarantees right around what you're going to get out of it. Um, I personally wouldn't want to. Uh, having seen this bounding box example, I wouldn't really want to trust uh, something as general and fairly limited in terms of modalities as a uh, sort of chat GPT. 
Lots of other uh, use cases, uh, things like content moderation um, has really been on, on the rise recently. Um, when we see a piece of uh, you know, harmful content or uh, fake news, right, we understand it um, from a very kind of intuitive perspective. We've seen a lot of models fail at detecting this sort of harmful content because they don't understand these sort of side channel attacks, right? So uh, someone with a, a completely innocuous piece of text, but then uh, maybe layering audio on top of it that might be harmful or trying to cover things up um, in a, a way that fundamentally confuses uh, models that do not properly understand uh, the nature of, of multimodality. Finally, um, cases like generative AI, um, and we've seen uh, like the recently the, the results from models like Sora, right? We've seen curated results because we only, uh, you know, we, we've been seeing uh, pieces that have been uh, published kind of, uh, you know, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that best uh, showcases these as opposed to being generally available. Um, but even in these, and this is a new modality, but it's relatively simple, right? It's just video. Um, we're, uh, we're not bringing in all these other cross modalities. And we see issues right around temporal consistency. If you look very closely at some of these vehicles are disappearing as they drive down the street and they reappear. Um, when we use generative AI even to uh, you know, produce static images, right, with some text in them, the text is often garbled, right? So it's not, a, it's not being processed as a first class entity properly and in a performant way with tight guarantees around performance. Great, so we want to take a concrete example so we can understand both the inputs and the outputs that we'd expect from a multimodal model um, in a, a novel use case. So this is an example uh, of multimodal uh, surgery. So how would we uh, you know, truly change the game when it comes to, uh, let's say, a surgical, an operating theater, right? It's a very complex use case. It's extremely important, right? Someone might, they might die on the table. We're not dealing with, uh, you know, let's say, a, a creative use case, which is great, but less, uh, you know, immediately, uh, kind of critical and, and, and potentially uh, dangerous. So what kind of inputs do, would, would we want to put into a model like this? So, you know, patient history, right? Um, this could be every single doctor note that, a, uh, that was written on a patient, uh, but even within that, we get multi-modalities, right? It could be a history of all the CT scans they've got, which is a different modality to, to text or uh, kind of basic imagery. Could be bringing in uh, live feeds of the operation, both from the operating theater, but also, let's say, from the, uh, the devices that have been inserted into the person. We've got sensor data. Uh, we're going around, uh, let's say, we're, we're doing something very complex, um, like navigating inside arteries or, or cutting out a, a tumor in, in this example. Um, we've got sensor data around what these robots are feeling and what they're sensing, right? So we need to treat that as well as a first-class modality. Things as well like controller input. So the, the surgeon is, is controlling this, uh, this robot into the individual. And finally, voice, right? So surgeons. I think literally have their, their hands full right when they're doing uh, they're, they're doing a, a complex operation, and we need to be able to have them interact in a very natural way, um, but also look at things like you know understanding the communication within the whole surgical team uh, and these kinds of uh, these kinds of uh, items of data that are being produced. On the output, um, we can again have a range of modalities to so things like uh, you know planning the operation. That plan might change over time as new things occur. Um, it can be robotic control, which is a different modality, right? That's a sort of uh, sensor uh, style uh, or an actuator uh, modality. And then finally, like safety, right? So the AI can help us uh, whilst we're in the middle of the operation, look for potential issues. How do we uh, you know, react to the combination of these factors changing to uh, ensure success in this really, really critical use case? So how do we actually build um, multimodal models? So, you know, we won't go into like the, the sort of full um, you know, technical uh, pieces here, um, but the main kind of pieces that we see here um, in, in terms of uh, building them are how do we represent the data, right? So how do we take this uh, real world data and represent it um, in a way that uh, the best expresses the, the modality that we're, we're inputting? How do we um, measure the kind of interaction of the modalities, right? How do we express it? So in that really complex like surgical use case, you know, we were dealing with sort of five or six different modalities. Like, how do we represent the interaction between them? Um, and then finally, how do we uh, process all that information to, uh, to generate some sort of output? Now, the sort of take home here um, is that we've seen kind of good uh, success in terms of taking really state-of-the-art foundation models um, and then fine-tuning those uh, in order to uh, express those different modalities and then mix them together to, to get some output. Um, a quick sort of uh, visual overview of this. Um, 
use a sort of language vision and, and audio use case. But again, as I've already said, we're not limited to just these kinds of uh, modalities. We've got lots of other ones that are traditionally sort of slept on in these use cases. Um, but we want to be able to align them so we can properly understand things like hierarchy, uh, more complex relationships even within, uh, let's say, the visual mode uh, with the, uh, the language mode and how things can, can change over time. Could you maybe explain what we're looking at here? Yes. Yes. So in, in the middle here, um, we have a sort of uh, Time lapse, right? So it's a it's a video of a, of, the, of the sun setting. Um, at the top we've got uh, you know transcribed uh, language, and then uh, at the bottom we have uh, an acoustic. So it could it be could be some sort of a narration, um, or you know this could be a, a sort of scene in a in a, in a you know, music video. Someone might be singing along to this. I'm going to relate these really complex concepts in a way that um, is easy to understand, but also allows us to perform. Uh, right, various queries. You might want to um, understand this uh, and say, uh, you know, what's the uh, what's the point of this video, right? Like, what's the emotion that's being uh, represented uh, throughout this video? And we could come up with a really, really complex output that could be text or, or, or maybe some new uh, video that we, we, we change. So in this overview, I think we, we are forgetting something. Um, and to this, I'd, I'd like to um, ask a, a question. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, with uh, Llama, um, which has been an uh, open, source, open source model uh, published by, by Meta AI. Um, do you roughly know sort of how many parameters that model has? Order of magnitude? 70 billion? Yeah, exactly. Um, are you familiar with the like types of activation functions that are used in this model? Um, for activation function called Swigloo, which is kind of interesting. Um, but you know, interesting that no one sort of picked up on that, right? You all knew the uh, number of parameters, um, didn't really know the activation function. Um, but did you do you know the sort of number of tokens, like order of magnitude that it was that it was trained on? So, trillions. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's one point. Yeah, one point four uh, trillion. And so, I think what to me that shows is, of course, like there is a lot of innovation going on in the architecture piece. But you know, if I want to take an open source model like Llama and I want to fine tune it for my particular use case. Am I going to go around and sort of really try and reinvent the wheel in terms of the architecture and these really specific components within the model? Or am I going to focus on showing it data that's relevant to my use case? And so the thing that you know we were forgetting there in, in that sort of process, um, when we talk about representation and alignment, is the data, right? Which seems really obvious, um, but is the, uh, the the core of all these models, right? So um, again, uh, a lot of these models, I think there's uh, there's a talk. Um, talk I watched a few months ago, um, where you know we said that these models are ultimately just an expression of the data that they're shown, right? And so we can uh, we we don't focus on the architecture. We can reuse these perfectly good architectures um, and just fine tune them with data that's that's relevant to us. Now, um, this becomes much much more difficult um, for time sort of specific applications, but also when you bring in cross modalities, right? So generating the appropriate uh, labels, relationship, and capturing these different um, uh, modalities together becomes much, much harder when you're dealing with some sensor data, uh, some video, uh, and some audio, let's say, um, as opposed to, let's say, just a huge corpus of text. Um, expressing things like hierarchies and relationships uh, becomes increasingly uh, complicated, requires really uh, you know, powerful and extendable ontologies. Um, the, the sort of thing that the sort of analogy here is, uh, you know, if you were building, you know, a traditional kind of software engineering approach, you're building a website, um, you can spend some time thinking about, okay, what kind of, you know, front end framework do I want to use? All these kinds of um, questions, but you know, what kind of problem am I going to be solving for my users, right? And what do I need to think about in terms of the data, right? So when I'm thinking about how to set up my database, I'm thinking about the data structures. I'm thinking about the queries that are going to be coming in at a very high rate, and how to set myself up for success in the that building phase and it's the same thing with uh, fine tuning these uh, these models and ultimately building multimodal models uh, where you need to think about the data structures right and really focus on the data to achieve uh, a, a good outcome what's an ontology sure um, so an ontology in this concept uh, in this uh, uh, in this context is uh, essentially the uh, the structure of the uh, of the metadata around the uh, the raw data right so if i'm looking at um, Let's say a video, um, and I'm trying to understand uh, how, uh, let's say, uh, different 
objects relate to each other, right? I need to build an ontology that will capture, um, let's say, the relationships and the hierarchies between all these objects. Then also within uh, the uh, metadata that's captured, I need to have a, a clear kind of like parent-child structure. Um, so it's the, it's essentially the, the, the yeah, to, the, the schema, right, of the of the labels that we're going to generate. It's also uh, referred to as taxonomy, depending on who you ask, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Edward. So um, I think this is a, a nice example of, uh, of how we would visualize a multimodal uh, model. You can see here um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, a sort of hyperspectral image of, uh, of a solar panel field. Uh, we've got a, a question, right? Like, is, is this current situation safe? Um, and then we pass, pass both of these modalities through state-of-the-art vision and language models. We can project the uh, visual modality combine these, um, and then we can have a, a, an answer. Now, what's important to, to note here is, uh, you know, we, we don't want to uh, do, you know, come up with a completely new vision model. Um, there are existing vision models that we can use and that we're going to fine tune. Um, we don't want to have to go through the whole training process from scratch, right? It's going to be incredibly expensive. Um, I think uh, LAVA, which is a, a, a vision model, um, took several weeks to train. I think it was two or three million dollars in the training uh, costs, right, just burning that on, on GPUs. Do we really want to start again from scratch? No. Um, we would much rather get away with uh, projecting these into, a, uh, into our embedding space and doing the sort of alignment piece um, rather than, than taking these from, from scratch and trying to build something completely novel. So we want to build on the shoulders of, of, of giants in this, in this example. Um, the other piece here uh, is, uh, is, you know, you can see all these embeddings in the, in the central uh, part of this diagram. Um, it's really alluding to the fact that these models, right, they, they, they speak embedding, right, like you know, they, what they understand is the embedding of these various uh, modalities so that they can then combine them and give us some, some sort of useful uh, output. So um, I want to drill down into some more kind of domain-specific applications in, in the real world. So um, here we have Lava Med. Um, and what they did in this in this situation is they took lava, um, which took you know three weeks on over two thousand GPUs to train. So again, very very expensive uh, process. Learned a lot about you know general uh, uh, concepts and uh, and the processing of, of imagery or general imagery. Um, but they were able to, to take this, um, show it extremely high quality data. Um, so you can see here this medical, con medical concept alignment stage which took about seven hours, and then the tuning phase which took about eight hours, um, and they used uh, eight GPUs in this uh, context. So uh, you can see uh, they, they sort of claim to fame of, of being able to do this within a day. Um, and the outputs here um, are, uh, you know, outstripping you know lava, uh, lava by itself, and also other state-of-the-art models like you know we touched on uh, you know the GPT series earlier being unable to draw bounding boxes. And uh, you might not be able to read this, um, but I'll sort of break it down for you. Um, in the top part, we have Lava Med being asked what's being shown in this image. So it's an X-ray, and it gives us an extremely accurate and detailed explanation, right? It's telling us there are bilateral patchy infiltrates, um, and it's using the right medical terminology and focusing on the right pieces here. It's telling us that uh, there are uh, endotracheal tubes and central venous catheters. If you just ask Lava the same question, it's telling us that there is a rib cage with wires coming out of it, which is likely a medical illustration or diagram. And that's not going to be very useful in a clinical context. Um, GPT-4 uh, does a, a decent job as well. It tells us it's a, it's a chest x-ray taken on day two of the patient's admission. Now, we, that's sort of metadata. It's not really useful to us. Um, and it uses some technical language. Um, but again, what it tells us with uh, whether there are devices implanted, it says yes, there is an endotracheal tube implanted, as indicated by the yellow line. Um, I think that's far less detailed, far less clear than the lava med model, which comparatively didn't take as long, you know, uh, to, to sort of, we didn't have to spend the same amount of money that I'm sure OpenAI uh, spent to uh, train this closed state, closed source, state-of-the-art model. Uh, we just fine-tune uh, an open source model and we achieve far better performance. So. In these applications, it's about it's about the data and about having a sensible fine tuning process, uh, but really building on off the shoulders of, of, of giants. Second example, um, you can see here. Um, this is uh, uh, we have two modalities: vision and language. 
And this is classic kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, clip cell approach of uh, aligning, right, these two uh, embedding spaces together so that we can have, uh, you know, concepts that sit together, right, both in the vision and the language domain be close together um, in, in the embedding space. And we can then uh, look at like new uh, situations that have not been seen in that sort of zero shot um, classification uh, approach, right? So we can have a generalized model in which we can uh, do really, really interesting things on, uh, on new situations that it might not have encountered. So in this process, uh, we're essentially uh, saying our, our target objective here is to align these two uh, different embedding spaces um, so that we can then do, do something uh, new. This will generalize, of course, to even greater numbers of modalities um, where we, we, we need to be able to uh, align all these different concepts and have appropriate uh, representations so that we can do things like filtering over the data um, or, or, or searching over it. So this is our, our second example around uh, geospatial uh, data. So um, we have a sort of image captioning task. So you can see we have got a geospatial uh, kind of imagery of an airfield. I think it's a, a it's a sort of soccer field. Um, and you can see uh, what our team uh, did is you can see our RSICD Encord uh, model. Um, they essentially took an existing model, so the RSICD model, um, and they fine tuned it um, and were able to, to achieve better performance uh, than what was, uh, what was already uh, available. So that was our RML team. They, they went away and, and did some magic. Um, but what I want to show next is you know, this is great for the captioning task. Um, it can be very useful for uh, classification, but it's showing uh, how you can use this to uh, sort of have a far better domain-specific model that will allow you to, uh, you know, filter and, uh, uh, and curate very large unlabeled data sets. So what we're looking at here, uh, you can see when the slider goes all the way to the right, we're just using a uh, tiny clip the embedding uh, on, on these images. When we go all the way to the left, we have the fine-tuned geospatial specific model. You can see that separation there. And then in, in between, it's a, it's a linear interpolation of, of the two. Now, these have colors on them, right? They're, they've got classes. Um, so we can, we can clearly see what these classes represent and we can see the clustering. But if I had a, a data lake and things were unlabeled, I mean, it's pretty clear to me which one I would rather have. Would I rather have a generic model or I'd rather have my uh, kind of fine-tuned uh, multimodal model uh, for sorting and organizing my data set? I've got the two static images as well. So you can see there uh, the general model um, and then the, the fine-tuned uh, model. So again, like how will this extend into new modalities, right? So you, where you want to achieve uh, good separation and, and, and good kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, classification of these different complex situations with really, really uh, you know, advanced interactions between all the, all the different modalities. So um, finally, we'll look at some of the, uh, the challenges. So um, you know, thought about these really interesting applications, things like the, uh, the multimodal surgery example, um, but like, why aren't we there yet, right? And this is something that, uh, the, the, you know, clearly we're not there yet, right? Uh, we don't have these, these advanced multimodal real-time uh, surgical models. Um, the first couple of pieces are relatively straightforward to solve, and then we get to the, the more complicated uh, items. So you know, data availability um, is often a poor, right? So we, we mentioned at the start that, um, you know, the availability of large corpuses of text um, have allowed us to really tackle the, the text domain first. Um, but for multimodal use cases, we don't have um, really high quality data, both across different modalities, but also in a specific uh, domain, right? So like the medical domain, notoriously difficult to find uh, high quality uh, data for. Um, but again, in, in other domains, uh, that is also the, the case. And th these labels don't exist um, and are, are hard to source. The inference speed is still pretty low. That gets even worse when you start adding more modalities. So in a real time use case and example, uh, sorry, use case and an application, um, you wanna make sure that you can have you know, quick uh, inference so that you can do things in, in real time potentially. Um, evaluating these multimodal models becomes very difficult. So, you know, thinking back again to that sort of chat GPT bounding box example, um, we don't have any performance bounds there. Um, how, do you, how do you express these performance bounds? How do you get guarantees on the performance of these models? Um, this is something I think we can, we can solve with having in high quality data that helps us sort of put together a really nice 
validation examples um, that we can use to, to evaluate our model performance and give some guarantees, um, but it's still still not quite um, not, not quite a solved problem. And then finally, the last two pieces, um, how do you measure the cross-modal interaction? So how do you ensure that, let's say, you, know, you are using this model in production in a sensitive use case, how do you ensure that, let's say, one of the modalities, uh, you know, the, the signal changes or there's some corruption, how do you ensure that your model is going to be robust in this situation and still continue to give uh, appropriate outputs? Uh, because we're not necessarily always going to have all the modalities available all the time uh, at, uh, at a high level of quality. Finally, explainability, I think this is still a problem that, that plagues these sorts of models. Um, you know, how do we make sure that we know uh, why these decisions are being made um, and how they're being made? And this, I think, is probably the, the greatest challenge in, in moving towards multimodality, where all of these different pieces around evaluation um, and explainability get even harder to do um, as you start to mix and match uh, these modalities to achieve something uh, that, is, that is more complex. So finally, just want to recap, you know, we, we, we talked about the challenges, but I think the, uh, the, the potential benefits and the uh, types of use cases that we can tackle are truly um, something that is going to be a complete game changer right for the industry. So things like the multimodal surgery, things like the, uh, you know, DNA powered personal assistant, all these sorts of things um, are around the corner, hopefully, uh, not, not too far in the future. Uh, but if we can solve these challenges, leveraging all the best kinds of models in specific modalities that are coming out, um, continuing to create high quality data um, and thinking of these you know, really, uh, really different and new use cases. I think we can, we can get there and that will be that I'm very excited. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Alex.